Definitely some future social workers and educators for us. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over now to Beth Ann Birdliner, our partner at REL West at West Ed, who's going to facilitate the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys hear us back there? We've got these funny headsets, yes? Okay, good. <laughs> well, good afternoon. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch and have happy bellies. Um, met somebody new or reconnected with somebody you haven't seen for a while. I know I did, which was really great. I also hope you had a chance to visit with the resource tables in the back. If you didn't, I strongly encourage you to check them out during our afternoon break. In just a few minutes, you're gonna hear from a panel of educators who are really key for moving um, what we've been talking about, trauma-informed practices from add-ons and um, things on the periphery and extras to being fully integrated into the mainstream, into the fabric of what we do in everyday life in our schools. In listening to this morning's uh, presentations, and to the student poets from Washoe, and to these uh, amazingly articulate fifth graders who just gave us a tour of their wellness center. I can't imagine that anybody here really needs any more convincing that this is really where we need to go, the direction we need to move in order to create more nurturing and transformative schools for all of our students, but especially for those who've experienced trauma in their young lives and face some really big bumps and hurdles. On this panel this afternoon, we have five social workers, mental health therapists, counselors, clinical intervention spe specialists, and veteran K-12 educators who across the arcs of their individual careers and across their careers together have been teachers, special educators, clinicians, trainers, community builders, research partners, and policy advocates. This really impressive lineup of uh, titles goes to show that the work of dealing with trauma in our schools is not done by any one role type. It really takes all of us, and that's just to amplify the theme that we heard throughout this morning's presentation, that this is the work of us all. The panelists bring varied expertise from different community and school contexts, and are very wise voices from the real world of supporting student needs in our classrooms. Um, it's my pleasure to briefly introduce each of the panelists before we hear about some of the amazing things that they're doing in their schools. Uh, I'll start with those of you who came from the Bay Area and then I'll cross the Sierras. And um, when I mention your name, can you just like wave to everybody so they know who you are? Uh, first over there, she came the farthest, is Jen Caldwell, a school social worker who developed and is the lead clinician from the Wellness Center that you just saw on the videotape. She's at El Dorado Elementary School in San Francisco Unified. So we had the good fortune of having a sneak peek into your workplace. So thank you for sharing that video. Across the bay is Robin Canales, who until recently provided direct services at Cox Academy in East Oakland, but who is now the Assistant Director of Clinical Intervention Services for the Seneca Family of Agencies, spanning schools in the Oakland and San Jose school districts, as well as a number of charters where she and her team offer individual therapy, trauma groups, and leadership in developing holistic trauma-sensitive school-wide practices. From Clark County School District in Las Vegas is Bob Wears, an educator wearing many hats to support students in the nation's fifth largest school district. Among other things, he supervises psychological services, mental health transition teams, and the district's Department of Student Threat Evaluation and Crisis Response. From Lyle, Lyon County is Michelle Watkins, a clinical social worker with an extensive background providing school and community-based support for students and families in rural areas. She's the executive director of a nonprofit agency that provides behavior and mental health supports and oversees the students, uh, student assistance at Dayton High School. And from right here in our own backyard in Reno is Megan Evans from Washoe County School District, a counselor and therapist who also wears many hats to support local students, including offering individual group and family counseling. And she currently serves as the counselor for the district-wide intervention focusing on trauma supports, violence prevention, and social emotional learning. So thank you all so much for joining us here today. So I'd like to start our conversation with each of you taking no more than maybe just two or three minutes to sort of set the stage, set the context, to briefly describe first your school or district or community context, and then second, um, to sort of answer the question, why did you adopt trauma-sensitive pra practices, to unpack for us just a little bit um, 
what are the student and school challenges that you're really trying to address? So I think for this question, I'll start with you, Robin, and we'll just go right down the line. So just two or three minutes to set the context. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Robin Ganellis, and I work with Seneca Family of Agencies in California. Um, I'm with the All In program. All In stands for Allied Interventions, and we've developed an unconditional education model. Um, and our, our pr purpose, or our mission, was to make sure that every child um, has the opportunity to attend their neighborhood or community school, and at that school that they would receive um, an inclusive learning environment uh, where they could get all the needed supports and, um, and that they feel safe and respected in that environment. And so, um, as Beth Ann mentioned, uh, I work uh, primarily in schools in the Greater Bay Area. So we have schools in Richmond, California, Oakland, California, San Jose, San Francisco. Um, and what we know about the, the populations of the schools that we partner with, um, they have experienced high levels of trauma. Um, they're in high-risk high risk neighborhoods and high-risk communities. Um, so some of the risks that they experience, um, poverty is one of them. Um, at, at Cox Academy, which is where I began, 98% uh, of the students received free and reduced lunch. Um, there's a high level of community violence in that neighborhood and gang violence. Um, and these are some of the things that we're working on um, when we're working with our schools to better understand how to support the ch kids that have experienced trauma. Hi, I'm Megan Evans from Washoe County School District right here. <laughs> I'm with the Peace Grant, which um, is a relatively new grant, started last year and we really got rolling this year. And the goal of the Peace Grant is to intervene with students who've experienced trauma or violence in their lives and hope to kind of break that cycle of future trauma or future violence. Um, Peace stands for Prevention of Violence, Educational and Social Emotional Learning, Ambassadors to Schools, counseling services for students and families, and empathy shared with everyone. Um, our grant came about after um, a series of tragedies that have kind of touched Washoe County School District. And what came, became very clear was that tragedy has become much more the norm than I think we want it to be. And um, there was a grant with Sparks Middle School um, for helping students from the tragedy there. And, Catherine Loudon, who's my superior, came and wrote the grant for the Peace Grant. Um, our grant covers the North Valley schools primarily, and then we also include Inspire and Innovations, which are two alternative education programs in Reno. Um, I would say some other things about our district. It is large, um, and I think that's part of the reason we've really looked into the North Valley is there are no supports up there for mental health. There's barely any medical supports. There's nothing for the kids to do up there. So there seems to be a lot of violence and, and some unhealthy trends coming out of that area. So this grant was written primarily to help that area. Um, some other things going on up there, we've got poverty, we've got um, a lot of families living with families, living with families, um, stories of kids living in broken down trailers in the back of their, ho their friends' houses, you know, all these different things. Um, and lots of pervasive trauma going on. Um, any student I get, it's, it's trauma upon trauma upon trauma when they come and see me, so. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle mm. Watkins with Central Line Youth Connections in Dayton, and I'm gonna bring a perspective coming from a social worker and also a community worker, because I'm involved in Healthy Communities Coalition of Lyon and Story County. So those will be my perspectives. Um, of course, Lyon County um, has probably 12 or more communities, but only five of those have schools in them that serve K through 12. Um, the population, Oops. the population, um, I believe, is about 7,600 students that attend um, the rural from the rural communities um, to our schools. The cultural population, though, is very different. Sorry about that, this little ear thing, okay. Um, we have rural farming and ranching communities, we have mining, we have industry, and then we're also bedroom community, where people are driving very long distances out to work. Um, we only have one community recreational center, and that's in Urington, which would be an hour's drive away from Dayton, or almost an hour from um, Fernley there, and that's a boys and girls club. And we have no, um, public transportation. So um, affordable housing, and I think the rural setting really uh, brings people to our community. Um, within the past eight years though, we've had economic growth, and then all of a sudden when the economy took a dive, 
um, we've had lots of um, disaster with that. So our populations that we see that are most stressed, of course, are the ones that we've been talking about today. Our families and children living in poverty, we have migrant workers, we have Hispanic and Native populations, transient students, culturally repressed families, families that have mental health and disabilities, and then we're seeing um, our senior citizens um, that can't meet their basic needs in the food banks, um, and they um, are raising their grandchildren. And I'm sure um, a lot of us see that as well. So many of our students, again, are living in hunger. Inadequate health care, um, divorce, living with other family members, grief and loss issues. And so currently through our uh, school assessments, we've seen a rise in children not having their basic needs met. We've also seen behavioral and mental health problems um, and parents not engaged in learning. Hi, I'm Bob Weirs from Clark County School District. Can you hear me? Yeah? I have a very weeny voice, so if I start tailing <laughs> off, you guys let me know. For Clark County School District, context is, uh, is a big piece of it. Fifth largest school district. Uh, official count for students in 2015-16 uh, was over 319,000 kids. An official count I heard just the other day was we're already well over 320,000. We are constantly growing. We are constantly changing. You heard a reference this morning about a 29% average for transiency rate. We have some schools that have doubled that margin year to year to year. By the end of the school, it's a completely different school than it started at the beginning of the year. You heard a story this morning about a, a young student, elementary, primary grade student, who was disrupting the entire school. Five, six years ago, that was an infrequent occurrence. Now in some of our schools, it is a more regular, sorry to say, a very regular occurrence. So we have a constantly changing population. Probably the best example too, from 1415 to 1516, we jumped from a free and reduced lunch from 57.5% to 62. A one year jump of 4.5% so that three in five kids are on free and reduced lunch, one in five kids limited English proficiency. Beyond the basic needs of growth and associated with the pattern of an urban school district, Ooh, that's not good. Uh, we've been seeing some acute problems that increased our attention to the need for mental health services. Can you still hear me? Okay. <laughs> uh, just a couple of examples. In 2010, we saw a spike in the documented uh, suicides for children within Clark County School District, nearly doubled in that year. It's, scared a lot of us, driving a need for more acute attention and intervention relative to students in crisis. Over the years, we see an escalation at the school level of needing to intervene with students in crisis. And uh, concurrent to that, you also saw for a long time escalating numbers of kids that were receiving discipline issues. Also growing along, and something I'll talk about later today, other questions, is we saw a lot of kids moving in and out of hospital placements from the school, in the hospital, and back relative to mental health issues. We had no idea uh, how many kids. Half the time, we couldn't even see them coming. So there's huge challenges associated with Clark County being a large urban district that's constantly growing and changing, acute problems that are developing. We saw a huge need immediately to address crisis issues, to be very reactive, but be, get better at what we're doing. But a long-term solution has to be in moving down so that we're addressing more supports for at-risk kids and even more preventative education under a multitude system of supports. Oh, I'm not used to being on a microphone. <laughs> so I'm from El Dorado Elementary School, which is in the Visitation Valley neighborhood of San Francisco. So that's kind of the southeast section of the city. It's, our school is housed in a primarily working class neighborhood. Most of the kids that we serve um, live in the nearby Sunnydale Housing Projects, which is one of the more violent areas of San Francisco. And we got introduced um, to trauma-informed practices about seven years ago. There was an article um, in the uh, San Francisco Chronicle about the high number of um, San Francisco Unified students who had um, PTSD symptoms. And so the school district was thinking, what is it that we can do to um, combat these symptoms and these problems that are resulting from um, the exposure to trauma. And so our school was selected to partner with um, a program called HEARTS with UC uh, UCSF. And 
the whole goal of the HEARTS program was to train staff and uh, teachers on how to work with students and, um, who had experienced trauma, develop school-wide systems and structures, and then also to provide interventions to students on site. And so we were uh, fortunate to have an administrator at the time who was really all about the whole child. He really strongly believed that um, in order to be able to learn, a kid's social emotional needs had to be met. And so that was one of the reasons why we were chosen to participate in the program was because we had an admin that was really advocating for that and really believed that that was the way to help the students ultimately be successful in life and successful academically. And at that time when we started working on with the trauma-informed practices and shifting to that lens, we were struggling with really big disruptive behaviors. When I first started working at El Dorado six years ago, I was shocked to feel like I was stepping into what felt like a day treatment facility with teachers and staff that weren't trained to work in a day treatment facility, kids fighting, literally climbing out the windows. It was really a complete chaos with little to no structures or systems, really poor attendance issues, lots of suspensions, really regular staff turnover, and just kind of feeling like you're in crisis mode all of the time. Thank you. So everyone here in this room today is really interested in learning from you guys about the trauma-sensitive supports that you're using to address student needs. So sorry, Jen, I'm going to start with you because you're elementary focused and we're going to work our way across here. But starting with Jen, followed by Megan, since you're both working in elementary schools, can you please describe for us some of the key on-the-ground practices um, and share some specific examples of what you do. What does it look like so that people can leave here in their mind's eye with a picture of that? So Jen, why don't you kick off this discussion and you'll each have about five minutes to really dig in and describe what it is that you do. Okay, um, so we have a lot of uh, systems and structures that we've developed over the course of the last seven years to support students who have experienced trauma and a lot of what we really tried to do was focus on our tier one intervention, so to get that kind of base of supports really strong, which then helped us kind of uh, decrease the number of tier three kids. And so what that kind of looks like is all of the classrooms at our school have a peace corner or a peace table, so that's something that now is universally done in all of our K through fifth grade classrooms. Um, we have the wellness center that you saw in the video. Um, we have a school-wide PBIS system, which is our super me's that um, we've been doing for about three or four years now at this point. K through five uh, classrooms are all receiving uh, second step lessons, so that's, um, that social emotional curriculum has been implemented school-wide. We have yearly staff trainings and restorative practices and trauma-informed practices. So that's started at the beginning of the year and then hopefully if we can get on the PD calendar also done throughout the year as well. Uh, we have a mentoring program at our school. The teachers have a real focus on relationship building. All teachers are using classroom circles, at least having a morning circle and a closing circle. One of those is happening in every classroom and hopefully a lot more also to address conflict. Um, and we also, last year, one thing that we did that's been really helpful is we extended our trainings and our wellness center hours to support our after school program that's on site. So that way, those, the students are being supported all the way, well, almost all the way to the end of the time that they're at El Dorado. And then also, those staff are being trained so that they can continue the work that the teachers are doing during the school day. And I guess as far as what I do during the day, it kind of looks different depending on the day, but I'm, sometimes I'm manning the wellness center, I'm doing groups, working with kids individually, consulting with teachers, doing classroom lessons, case management, parent meetings, a lot of different things. Thank you. I know WASHA works closely with both elementary and secondary schools, so Megan, feel free to talk about elementary practices as well as what's going on in your secondary and alternative schools. Okay, and, and right now I'm mostly in the secondary. Mostly in secondary, mm -hmm. right, okay. Um, so I was gonna go back a little bit that I came from a history of really wanting to get this trauma-informed practices out into the gen ed population. I'll use my SPED speak for a minute. Mm -hmm. It came from a special ed setting where we were doing day treatment. Um, when I got my counseling degree, I went in to work at a program that's an alt ed program for kids with mental health disabilities that impede them from being successful in the general ed setting. So I, in the past, oh, it's been like 10 years, I really grew a passion for what helps these kids be successful. How, how are we helping them be successful in this small setting and how can we transition that into the bigger setting? So when this opportunity for the Peace Grant came about, I really felt like this was my chance to help do that. 
And so um, that's a lot of what shaped me was my mental health background and my special ed experience and wanting more kids to have access to that because we all know the trauma doesn't just happen in special ed. It also doesn't just happen with kids we know about. There's so many we don't know. Um, so a lot of what we do, if we, and I do a lot, um, we're offering more therapeutic services in the North Valleys. So what that entails is we've started with some PATS groups, which if you guys know when kids get in trouble for violence, they usually have to go down to another school that's about 15 miles into town and take classes with their parents because they're in trouble, because they were using substances. And what we've done up in the North Valleys, and specifically at North Valleys High School, is put in two groups, one for violence and one for substance use. And the kids are now able to do more therapeutic groups rather than going down and having a psychoeducational class. They're actually able to process their reasons for use, their reasons for violent behavior, different things like that. Um, we've also got going um, some MFT support. So marriage and family therapists were starting to get into the schools, which has been phenomenal, um, especially in the North Valleys. The thing that we've experienced out there, like I said, is there's, there's next to no resources out there. And so we're getting some MFTs to come out and start working with children and families who've experienced trauma and violence. Um, we're hoping to expand that to after hours as well because we're finding families that have different hours and to get them what they need we need to be a little more flexible and we're contracting with local groups such as quest counseling they come in they do um, our violence or substance use intervention class as well as a group called seeking safety they work with students who've experienced trauma um, some of which in our schools and do some groups so the students can learn skills to use when they're becoming dysregulated dysregulate, or escalated. They now have some skills in place that they can go to to use. Um, on top of that, we also have evaluations through Quest Counseling for substance use, as well as I run some groups every week. Um, I also do individual counseling. We have two social workers now on site with us or in our area with us who um, are amazing and they get the basic needs met to families. Um, with that pyramid they were showing earlier that kids can't learn until they have all these things in place, it's so awesome to have social work in there now because they really are, they're getting to the base. I mean, we're taking families food, we're getting them clothes, we're helping them fill out forms to get insurance and that's been an amazing change this year that I've seen um, and then I also attend all those family meetings, school meetings, try to get as involved as I can so that we're bringing in a mental health component to helping teach the whole child. Thank you. <laughs> Michelle, I understand that the work you're doing is really community-wide, but you're also providing very targeted supports to the students at Dayton High. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about some of the practices that you're putting in place in this very rural high school? Sure. Um, one of our programs is called Project Success, and it's an evidence-based um, was adopted um, 11 years ago and um, we only had it in two schools so basically it's a student assistance program that has about four components to it one of them being we go into the ninth grade health classes and we teach social skills and we uh, different kinds of topics regarding like stress management and we talk about normal adolescent development because you know all of our teens think they're bipolar, right? I mean, if you start talking, they're like, yep, I'm bipolar. Mm -hmm. um, and then other topics um, regarding peer pressure. And so we, we go and teach those eight sessions. Um, sometimes it can be pretty challenging with all those little ninth graders, but um, what we found is that we can identify kids right in the room that are going through difficulties. Um, so, you know, you can see their faces, and then, um, uh, and then they will come forward, too, if they need extra help. So we're catching them right then in the ninth grade. Um, another component is we do assessments and referrals. So kids are brought to us for a variety of different reasons, whether it be academic, mental health problems, um, of course suicide, ideation right now is huge as well. Um, it's, it's scaring us too. We just had a suicide, um, a ninth grader um, took his life in um, December and so it's been very upsetting for our community and our staff. So. Um, our project success counselors can do those assessments and then we also do individual support because we know our school counselors are very busy 
And so they are just very happy to have us there to help them. And then uh, support groups are also developed, depending on what the need is. So most of my counselors right now are doing stress management, emotion control, lots of grief and loss groups over the years. I mean, I've been in these schools for 26 years, and I don't think I've seen so much grief and loss until lately, honestly. So um, we are so fortunate right now because we have um, some safe schools money and then the social work money, which is like fabulous. So we've been able to um, provide these programs in other communities. So now we have Project Success in four of our high schools and we'll be, um, we, we have it in one middle and we're gonna expand it to another middle school as well. Thank you. And Bob and Robin, your work crosses um, multiple schools in multiple districts or district-wide in the case of Clark. Uh, let's start with you, Robin, and hear a little bit about the supports being used in Oakland and San Jose and some of the other urban areas. And could you um, tell us a little bit more about the unconditional education coaches, what the role of the coaches? I just find that to be a, a new and really beautiful professional title to be an unconditional education coach. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so we work in schools. We work from TK all the way up through high school. Um, um, and uh, our unconditional education model, and those of you that are familiar with clinical language or maybe just have heard of unconditional care, it's the belief that care should not be conditional. And um, so we've extended that to be that education should not be conditional. Um, and like Megan was saying, we want to support um, kids in a gen ed setting um, and not separate them out and put them into a special education class or separate special education kids from the gen ed population. Um, so we're working in all of our schools to, to build supports um, through the RTI model, which I know Jen mentioned too. Um, so our unconditional education coach is a position that's funded by a federal grant, the I-3 grant. Um, it's funded for three years, so we're still um, in the process of, of, we're in our second year um, of this model, and then, um, so it's funded through three years, and then we'll have to see from there how it goes. But our unconditional education coach is really responsible for coordinating all the services and um, collaborating and providing a, as a liaison between service providers and administrators and school staff. And one of their main roles is also to gather data and do progress monitoring, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit about what types of data we're gathering. Um, but And then sharing that out with the schools and with the families and the communities and the students um, so that we can really track what we're doing and what's working and what isn't working and where we still need to work. Um, so I will start with tier three, um, and tier three are the, the kids that need more individualized um, services or supports. And so our clinicians provide individual counseling and family therapy. We also go into the communities and work with families in the community, and we provide intensive case management. Um, part of that process is also working with kids with individualized education plans um, and really working on building that family engagement um, with the school. Um, in our tier two level, we are providing push in and pull out group services. Um, we provide social skills groups, CBITS groups for the sixth grade and up, and then for the elementary schools, the bounce back group, which is the equivalent of CBITS for elementary school kids. Um, we also do zones of regulation, um, social skills groups, and uh, grief and loss groups. Um, and then we've also pushed into the classroom and done full class trainings or teachings about anxiety and what anxiety can do in the body and how, how you can tell if you have anxiety. And so we developed curriculum for kids too to start to build that awareness with it for, for the kids um, so that they can learn what's happening in their body and how they can understand it. Um, and then what I really wanna focus on since we've talked a lot about kind of tier three and tier two interventions is what we're doing on a tier one level. Um, so some of the assessments that we do and when we partner with schools, we have a couple of assessments that we require that schools um, do, and, um, and these are done oftentimes multiple times throughout the school year. Um, so the first is the school climate assessment instrument, and it's called SKY, and um, that, that's given to school staff, parents, and students to fill out, and it really works on identifying the strengths of the school's climate and culture, and then areas where um, the school wants to focus their attention to build um, climate and culture in order to create a safer school environment, um, and a, an environment that feels more inclusive for all students and for families to feel welcome there. Um, then we also do a social emotional screener which teachers fill out for each of the students um, and this is really focused on observable behavior so we're not asking teachers to, to diagnose kids. Um, we're really focusing on observable behavior so that we can start to um, get a sense of what kids might need additional supports and how we can start to um, 
divide our resources so that we can support the kids and the supports they need. Um, what, this, what this screener also does, though, is let us know which teachers might need additional support. So if teachers are screening, are, are filling out the social emotional screener, and they've said that 60% of their class are, are engaging in the high risk behaviors, um, that's, a, that's a sign to me that perhaps the teacher needs a little bit more support and not necessarily 60% of their students. Um, so that's where we do a lot of coaching and, uh, coaching and consultancy with the teachers around building culture in their classroom and putting behavior management systems in place and positive behavioral systems in place, excuse me, systems in place. Um, which brings me to our next assessment, the Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports Tiered Fidelity Index. And I know Christopher Blodgett mentioned that um, PBIS is something that we, um, is closely aligned with trauma-informed practices and um, we do, we do uh, work with PBIS in all of the schools that we partner with, um, but we really wanna make sure that it's being implemented with fidelity. And so we do, um, we do, these, uh, the tiered fidelity index, which we give to the School of Climate and Culture Committee to measure um, and to fill out. Um, then we also have a trauma-informed matrix, which, um, which looks at uh, trauma-informed practices across five categories. Um, the first is staff development. The second is the school environment. The third is policies of the school. The fourth is engagement of families and students. And the fifth is service provisions. Um, and so we asked schools to complete that so that we can be aware of where we might need to put in additional supports um, in order to make sure that trauma-informed practices are being implemented throughout the school. And then the last one is the annual implementation plan where the coach, the unconditional education coach, works closely with the school administrators to um, look at all of the collection of data and to really identify goals that they wanna, that they wanna focus on throughout the school year. Um, and it's based on the data, that they, the data that they've collected from students, from families, and from the teachers that have filled them out. Um, so that's, that's where we're working in the tier one level. Um, and what comes out of that a lot of times is, is us going in and providing um, trauma-informed education PDs for staff. And when we say staff, we mean all staff at the school. We mean um, classified staff. We mean yard duty staff, after school staff, teachers, um, janitorial staff, cafeteria staff, um, administrators. Um, we, we really believe that anyone that interacts with the student should have a common language and a common way of, of interacting with the student and come from a common perspective of how to build relationships and create a sense of safety. Um, we also uh, provide um, crisis response trainings for teachers, um, as well as self-care and vicarious traumatization for teachers, because we know that they're the ones on the front line. And um, I know a number of speakers here have mentioned that we really need to support our teachers and kind of being self-reflective and taking a look at themselves and maybe even identifying own, their own traumas that they've experienced and how they can get support around that so that they can be available to build those relationships with students. Um, and then we also support um, the uh, social emotional curriculum at schools. I know uh, second step has been mentioned quite a bit um, and a lot of our schools have adopted toolbox as their social emotional curriculum which is also great and I highly recommend looking into it. Um, and that's, that's kind of where we're, where we're focusing on a tier one level to support our schools. Great, thanks. And Bob, your work reaches across a very large district. Can you tell us a bit about some of the trauma-informed practices found in your schools? Yes, um, <clears throat> we're hoping we get down to tier one and tier two, uh, but as a large district, we're still trying to get our arms around growing mental health issues and the need to um, uh, intervene with students and, and uh, reduce crisis level events for, for students. Very briefly, I'm going to highlight a couple of things that we've been focusing our concentration at the district level to make a difference and intervene at the least intrusive level possible. Number one is we have developed a suicide intervention protocol and we've mobilized teams at the school level. It's comprised of school counselors, school psychologists, school nurse, and, and we're available a uh, school social worker. These are clinical interviewing procedures that are implemented by some combination of those two to help them differentiate medical issues versus more uh, violent criminal behavior. So we're dealing with more mental health types of issues. We've also established procedures so we can inform our school police officers to say, you know, this is a child who probably needs to be hospitalized versus intervening at a uh, least restrictive level. We've done a lot of work over the last four years. Systematically, we reviewed and revised these procedures and then we followed it up with training. And I don't want you to lose sight of the scope of what we're talking about here. Over the last four years, we systematically trained and retrained about 180 to 200 licensed staff members in psych services, predominantly school psychologists, approximately 200 
school nurses, 650 pushing 700 counselors, and then our small social work department, about 30 of them. We've systematically reviewed procedures and trained year by year by year. Um, so we're getting better about addressing crisis to help keep kids out of detention, out of being sent home for discipline issues, being sent to the hospital. A second element is our longest standing specialty group, and that's the Department of Student Threat Evaluation and Crisis Response. These are very specialized, gifted people who, uh, we're talking five psychologist positions and four counselors who do a variety of services in support of schools. Those include crisis intervention, may either direct support or increasingly consultative support to the school-based intervention team. They also conduct threat assessments and comprehensive evaluations. Uh, they're the only element in town to help schools organize on critical event and post fashion. Just that today, they responded to a school where there was a loss of a staff member to make sure that there's counseling supports in place for kids and for staffing to get everybody organized. They also follow some of the kids with the significant ACEs, would be a good descriptor of that. Kids with very chronic issues who need integration back into schools from, from various locations and they provide some counseling support and some integration supports for back into school. They also do a lot of training. They've been around for about 12 years. It grew out of a grant. It grew back into psychological services, but they are fundamental at a district level to help provide additional services at the school level to intervene with crisis events for individuals and groups of students. The third group, I mentioned that we saw a lot of kids floating in and out of hospital placements, predominantly acute placements on a short-term basis. We mobilized what was, we developed what was, uh, we referred to as a mental health transition team. And these are uh, some dedicated people. It's a multidisciplinary staff, a psychologist, a nurse, a counselor, and a social worker. And we systematically targeted relationships with three entities, the hospitals, where they first, parents are dealing with these issues of a child being placed in a hospital and what to do and how to bring the child back to school with the families themselves and with the schools. Um, just to share numbers, um, last year we processed 1,485 referrals in relation to kids transitioning back from hospital placements. The year before, it was, who knows? because it was done very informally at a school level, a lot of those kids we missed. In terms of crisis intervention, I mentioned that before, the suicide intervention protocol, over 2,100 documented interventions last year of kids in crisis where we intervened. We have a lot more going on in the district trying to push down into more supports for at-risk kids and tier one, educational preventative. We do have initiatives related to positive behavior supports, juvenile assessment center, which is a collaborative we're trying to get out of the, uh, underway um, down in Clark County that involves Department of, uh, Division of Child and Family Services, Department of Family Services, Juvenile Justice, and so on, so that we can do some initial screening and line them up with appropriate resources. We're looking to place social workers and mental health providers under SB 515. We had a number of positions assigned to our schools. Um, our early childhood program is fantastic. Early Childhood Special Education, Julie Casper, has been pushing the taxi model for positive behavior support, social emotional learning for years. So we have a lot of other things too, but as a large district, we continue to struggle with getting our arms around tier three, being effective in intervention so that we can push down and address, get it down to more helping earlier at-risk kids and even preventative educational. Thank you. So all of us here in our real worlds of working with kids in schools and making systems changes, um, we know that this work is really hard and really messy and it moves slower than we want. Um, but given the experiences and building on all the good work that you guys have just described for us, can you tell all of us what do you think is really making the biggest difference? We'd like to hear about some of the positive changes that your students or your fellow educators or your schools are experiencing since adopting some of these practices. So if you can, just share some specific examples. I think that would be really helpful. So Robin, why don't we start with you this time and take roughly, I don't know, maybe like three minutes to describe some of the things that seem to really be working. Sure. Um, so I think it's best if I speak about a specific school, and the school that's nearest and dearest to my heart is Cox Academy because that's where I started as a clinician. Um, so at Cox Academy, it's where we've had our partnership for the longest. So we've been there for about 
five years now, um, with the unconditional education coach being there for two. Um, and now that we've started, and by the way, so we had a change in administration every year for four years that I was there. Um, this is the first year that we've had the administration for two years in a row. Um, not to mention the fact that um, I, think, I think Megan was mentioning um, that, or maybe it was another person on the panel, but was mentioning that the, the, the environment that we were working in, we had kids that were engaging in very high risk behaviors. Um, they were running out of the classroom, they were pulling down all the bulletin boards, they were trying to go, run out of the school building into the streets, they were kicking staff and, and students. Um, and so uh, we saw some real shifts um, mostly from, so what, one of the biggest lessons I've learned is that it can't just come from the top down and it can't come from the bottom up. It has to be a mix of both. And so in some cases we had teachers that were really on board and administrators that weren't and so the administrators didn't have policies and resources in place to support what the teachers wanted. And then in other cases we had the administrators kind of slap down like this is what we're doing and the teachers weren't quite on board and so the teachers didn't feel like they, um, they were aligned with what the administrators wanted. Um, and so in the last two years, I would say, um, with the use of a lot of these assessments that we are giving to the, to the parents, to the students, to the teachers, to the administrators, we were getting um, information from all of the important stakeholders um, so that we were really able to develop uh, goals that were, that were realistic for our school community at where we were, um, and so we could really start to see the progress. And I would say that um, I've seen the progress start by number one, being able to get on the PD calendar. We have three trauma-informed education PDs on the PD calendar this school year um, to really focus on um, to really focus on trauma-informed practices. Um, in one of those, um, which is one that I lead, we talk about, and I think Christopher Blodgett used the term encoded lessons. Um, from Seneca, we use the term um, internal working model. And so basically, it's the internalized beliefs the kids have developed based on their early life experiences. And a lot of times for kids that have experienced trauma, that belief is, my world is isn't safe or I don't trust people. And so um, we really worked with teachers to develop an understanding and a language around this idea of the encoded lesson. Um, we developed an internal working model worksheet that we could, that clinicians could sit down and do with teachers until they felt like they had um, mastery of the tool themselves so that they could work and, and basically um, identify interventions that were really rooted in providing the child with a different experience, something that was gonna disconfirm their beliefs that they had developed. And as we know, it takes consistency across adults um, and time for kids to have this different experience. And so creating a common language and a tool that teachers could use to really root their interventions in something that was gonna be specific to what that individual student needed, not some blanket intervention that, that you think could work for all kids, because we know that doesn't work. Um, so we really worked with teachers on building their capacity to understand how we develop uh, treatment plans and how we build interventions in order to support kids. And then from there, and, and all of it is rooted in building a. a an environment of safety and trust, which is all rooted in building relationship. Mm -hmm. And so from those trainings, what we've seen is teachers starting to reach out and build relationships with their most difficult kids, kids that they would otherwise send to the office. So we really track office discipline referrals, um, and we track the different um, methods that, teacher that teachers use in order to intervene with kids, and we've noticed a real shift in, um, in teachers coming back to, and responding to kids in a way that really promotes relationship building. And so I would say that that was the biggest shift that I've seen over the last two years, um, and, and I hope it continues. That's wonderful. Megan, what are some positive, positive changes you've experienced? Well, it's funny that you're talking about the way the teachers kind of shift, and I was reading my notes and going, oh yeah, that's about what I was noticing too. <laughs> From the beginning of the year, maybe even this year, when the teachers, that, you know, staff, admin, you know, the kid's being bad, he's misbehaving, he needs to get in trouble for this, you know, kind of that mentality to now when we notice kids are having trouble or their behaviors are escalating, they're asking more questions like, I wonder what's going on, I wonder if something happened in the student's family or, you know, really trying to problem solve rather than just, it's the kid's fault, let's put them over there and, and move on. Um, and that's been just absolutely heartwarming to me just to notice the shift in language. Um, some other things that we've had that have started to come up are an increase in the community services coming out into the schools, coming to support us. Um, 
that's been huge and I know that there's plans in the works to continue that and I'm very excited to see this continue on because I, a lot of the speakers are talking about kind of that community in schools and, and that's something I think, especially in the North Valleys, we're missing. There's not a lot of community up there so to get in what we can is just huge. We just have the families is what I mean. We don't have like the businesses and the, you know, adopting schools and coming in and doing all these different things. So that's been a huge positive. Um, personally, in seeing all the students I see, um, in, in thinking about what I was going to answer for this, it changed every week because every week there's something new happening. Another student has done something amazing that I feel like we wouldn't have happened without the Peace Grant and without what we're doing for them. And um, just as recently as last week, um, it started the week before last, I had a group and a student came up and, you know, she was just kind of saying, you know, I need something, but I'm not sure what. And, you know, we continued to talk and it turned out she was um, expressing some pretty high suicidality. I mean, she had some very high ideation. And firstly, for to be a support for her to come to. She had the group, she felt secure enough during group to say, hey, I need to check in after group and then to wait around and then come up and, and have this discussion was huge. Then, you know, the next step is we need to get some people involved to get you, keep you safe and, and get your needs met and to be able to call, you know, mobile crisis unit who had no teams available, but the director came out and, um, you know, helped assess the student, the, the family came in, we were all able to work together, the school was there. And since then, Mobile Crisis has continued to come out every other week to work with this student until they get um, things in place because we decided not to go to West Hills, which is our acute care for mental health issues, and decided to try and work this in a different way. And it's been very successful. I, you know, I check in with her um, among everyone else, her counselor from her other grant, her, her school counselor, and it's just been amazing to see that all work together. Um, and that's, those are the parts where I realized that this is, this is awesome and you know, hope that we can get more going this way. Great. Michelle, what are some good things that you see are happening in Lyon County? Um, I'm, gonna talk, I'm gonna talk from a community perspective mm -hmm. for a minute, okay? I get to switch hats. But, Anyway, um, using a collective grassroots approach really has brought a lot of intentional services. So um, when, our, when our economy took that dive in 2008, um, you know, it brought forth a lot of different issues. And so our school district really was the key in helping bring all the partners together through our coalition called the Healthy Communities Coalition um, and taking a look at what we have in strengths as a partnership and what um, the school needs. And so that, that, was, that was real big. And so from that, we developed a health hub in 2013. And those are service providers, mental health um, providers, school and community volunteers all working towards the same goals. Um, and then, of course, with the Safe Schools money, that really helped launch off a lot of our programs. Um, it also helps families enter the system at any point. So um, currently, as partners, we have school gardens, we have food banks with backpack programs. We have student assistance programs. We have school resource coordinators now that help bridge the gaps of service between our schools and our families. We have mental health and prevention and intervention services, youth employment and volunteer opportunities. And it really is our belief that not all kids and families need mental health. Sometimes they just need those resources and connections to the community. Um, so we use um, a case management approach with our resource coordinators doing that. Um, as far as the school level goes, um, I think our school admin is fabulous. I mean, they really have a passion in working with young people just like all of you as well. And so as a team, we try to approach some of these problems. So instead of, you know, a kid that's suicidal getting put into the counseling office and, and then, you know, just not knowing what to do in a rural community because we don't have a lot of resources, we try to work as a team as far as our counselors and our nurses are very important and our juvenile probation officers as well and so just trying to get those prevention and intervention services um, in that respect is good so um, another thing we're doing is um, signs of suicide screenings we started those a few years ago and um, we were only doing them like in the ninth grade health classes but now we've expanded to do those in 
in all of our classrooms with all of our students. And of course, that's brought forth a lot of issues, though, sometimes, but um, it's, a, it's a good screening, and um, we definitely need it. Um, also, in, in our schools, when a kid was suicidal, they would call the police department. So imagine that in a small community where maybe the night before that officer came to your house, maybe there was a d domestic issue, and then here he is at school because you know, you're, you're thinking about committing suicide. So thank goodness that's kind of stopped in, in some of our schools, and they are um, actually using our counselors to do their assessments. Thank you. Uh, Bob, what would you like to add from the Clark experience? What are some positive things that you're seeing from your good efforts? Well, I see, um, two trends that uh, we see as very uh, welcoming. Uh, first is uh, we are starting to see more effective or, or more successful uh, partnerships with uh, community enti entities. And I'll give you just a couple examples. Uh, I mentioned the mental health transition team and seen over almost 1,500 referrals process last year. Um, we probably we had tried to develop it about five years ago, and it was a false start. It didn't work. And this time, we actually worked with community entities to help us get it underway. The Clark County Children's Mental Health Consortium in general, and Nevada PEP in particular, were very instrumental in helping us develop procedures, give feedback, and so on. And I think it's a huge reason why it's actually working this time. Second of all, in terms of re, uh, the suicide intervention protocol and intervening with kids in crisis and trying to de-escalate them, we picked up partnering with the uh, Division of Child and Family Services mobile mm -hmm. crisis team also. And um, it's been huge in terms of an extension of providing services, wraparound services for 30 days, something beyond the capacity of schools to provide to families and students. And we actually, I think as a combination of that, reviewing procedures, training, and pulling in mobile crisis, we saw a 35% reduction in the number of kids that had to go in under legal 2000 hospital placements this past year. I think that's huge. And from a school district standpoint, internal to the district, you also see things happening in terms of people really talking, communicating, collaborating, collaborating more effectively. Our interests were always there, but many times they were parallel. You see things now like, um, um, our Operation Respect Welcoming Schools is an initiative that looks at positive behavior support, social emotional learning, anti-bullying activities, suicide prevention, all wrapped into one. So the different entities with precious resources and limited staff are starting to line up on certain initiatives like positive behavior supports. Um, the other one I'd mentioned internally is by working we, re we talk regularly across health services, wraparound services, our social workers, psychological services, counseling. We have regular dialogue and alignment for training purposes, review of procedures, and so on. Much more effective, and more recently, the last couple, or a couple years ago, we were able to take the Signs of Suicide educational program and move it from uh, a pseudo intervention piece where we went into schools for screening purposes and incorporated it into the health curriculum for eighth and ninth grades. Mm -hmm. So we really, in turn, from the district making, forming relationships with community partners, I think is really starting to get some traction. And internally, I think we're getting more organized along central themes that line up with um, uh, trauma-informed care and general mental health services. And, and Jen, since we saw the video, we know that your school is a real shining star for how to do this work right. Uh, what do you think are some of the most promising outcomes since you guys have adopted this approach? So we, after we had implemented trauma-informed practices and restorative practice, kind of our big like number data that we saw was after the first, I think, four years, we saw an 89% decrease in suspensions and a 75% decrease in office referrals. So that was huge to see. And I think that that is as a result of a, a shift in the way that staff is looking at behavior at El Dorado. It's not what's wrong with you, it's more like what has happened to you, kind of like Megan was mentioning. And I think that the idea that you can't like consequence a behavior out of a child is a belief at El Dorado that has helped um, with some of our positive success. There's a, a common language, like adults are talking it out with kids, kids are talking it out with each other. Um, one of the second step uh, languages is, is that when your brain goes offline, you flip your lid, and that's a universal language that adults and students are using. And I wanted to share uh, one student story that I feel like kind of exemplifies 
uh, the success of trauma-informed practices and when a team's working at its best. So we had this third grader last year, who I truly believe if this third grader had come to El Dorado before these services were, and this way of thinking was implemented, would have been a referral to special ed for ED, which he didn't need. But, so this story of this friend that I will call Sam, he was a third grader last year, and he was having these really extreme blowouts after lunch where he was running through the hallway, ripping off things off of the wall. He was being aggressive to, and disrespectful to other staff and students. And then people would having to be following him around the school, trying to keep him safe, trying to keep other kids safe. And then it would kind of all culminate in him like just like sobbing on the floor somewhere. And so instead of trying to consequence this behavior, the team got together and thought, what is happening? And to the student, why is this? Why is this occurring? And this is a student that has had complex trauma experience in his life, but we found out that there was, well, he had known that there was a shooting in a nearby playground over the summer that happened in broad daylight at one o'clock in the afternoon that about 83 kids in San Francisco Unified witnessed. And through some, I guess, maybe sneaky back channels, we found out that this child was somebody that had witnessed that. And that the time that he was having these blowouts was the time of the shooting. And he was also on the playground when he was having these blocks because it was his lunch time. And so we were able to come together with the family team and the school team and create a plan where he, at the end of lunch, he got to go volunteer in a kindergarten classroom. So during their reading time, because that was somewhere that he felt strong, so he was able to build relationships, be a leader, build a relationship with that classroom teacher to kind of uh, develop a positive relationship with other grown-ups in the school. I transitioned him there, I transitioned him back to class. The teacher changed her schedule so that reading was then what he was doing when he came back to class, so it was an easy transition back to class. We were able to loop the family in, and we had uh, weekly, not weekly, monthly Team SAM meetings where the, week, the school staff and the family team sat together. The student was able to um, co-create co, uh, the agenda for that meeting, so it was very empowering for him to be able to participate that in that, and then also, Knowing that relationships are so key, we started developing his relationship with his fourth grade teacher at the end of his third grade year so that he knew what he was coming into in fourth grade. And so this kid is still exhibiting some problems, but nothing to um, that extreme level. And then the exciting news that we got recently was that the teacher did a recent FMP assessment and he jumped three reading levels just from like fall to January. So I think that that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that that's like a key example of how when you're viewing behavior and you're viewing children from this perspective, you're uniting a whole team of people looping in the family that you can really have extremely exciting success. And I think that that's always what everybody says is that the academics come once the social emotional piece is met. And then I feel like this is just a real great example of how that actually can happen. Yeah. Thank, thank you for sharing that. That's really great. Uh, lastly, based on your successes and struggles, um, we know this is really hard work. What advice do you have for all of our Nevada colleagues with us here today who want to either introduce or amp up or better integrate their trauma-informed practices into their schools and districts? So I think we have about two minutes. I can't see. How much time do we have? We have about five more minutes? Okay, so you each have one minute <laughs> to sort of wrap up and share your advice for your colleagues here about how to move this work forward. So why don't we start with you, Michelle? You're right in the middle of the group here. <laughs> I would say that it really takes um, community um, and schools to integrate services together. And um, that's been our focus for a couple years and we've made big strides. So as communities um, and schools, we need to look at the resources that already exist. And so that's how we began in that strengths-based approach, just saying what do we have already and what can we offer? Um, and of course, in rural communities, we don't have a lot of services, so we have to take a look at those first. Um, the big thing that we've done, which has been amazing, is bridging the gap so we can collectively um, work through barriers of policy, because policy could just um, stop a lot of things. Also develop shared outcomes, evaluation, um, and also um, shared outcomes. And so that really means changing things. And so that's been a big lesson for us all, especially doing all those consent forms, you know, that um, we can share information with partners in school districts as well. But we feel very grateful in County. We have a, a progressive county, um, 
and they, they say yes to a lot of things we ask for. Sometimes they go, oh my God, what are they coming here with now? But they have just been real forward in that. So um, a yes attitude really helps. Okay. Bob, what's your one minute of advice for your colleagues here? Well, I, I go into my broken record here right now. So mm -hmm. some of the key things I would say from a large district's per perspective is be strategic. I'm always emphasizing we should do a few things. We should target things specifically based on need, do them, and do them well. The second thing is to provide consistent response so that we can become more effective and efficient what we do. And one of the huge challenges we have with 357 schools is variability in practices, variability in support. So a huge amount of ground can be made up simply by getting more consistent what our practices are, focusing on what our targets are, and following through consistently. consistently. And then the biggest challenge is nothing's really changed from our game plan. We want to get better organized, more efficient, better sharing of resources, building partnerships and all that. We continue to push to try to push down. Moving away from a crisis reactive type of mode, getting down to the educational support components. How do we get social emotional learning in there consistently? How do we provide more counseling and other types of supports for kids? How do we make that happen? We have to keep pushing to build the infrastructure for services. Mm -hmm. Great. What about you, Megan? Um, relationships. Um, I think it's all about the relationships. I think being strategic with cultivating relationships in the community and those important stakeholders is not only important for to get the services that you need for your students and families, but to also work together so you're not overlapping things, you're not figuring out where the holes are with a family, what, what they need and, and what's getting overdone can happen. Um, it's also, I think, really helpful for families when you refer them somewhere and you say, oh, I know so-and-so there, you're in good hands. They feel a little safer with that move because going to go seek out mental health counseling or, you know, something big and scary like that is, is much more helpful when someone's saying, oh, there's mm -hmm. a face there that I know and you're, you're going to be okay. Um, the next one is being um, having a strong relationship with your schools, with your school staff. So you, you guys are moving around schools, and I, that's my first experience with this on such a large scale, and that's the big thing. Sometimes what I'm doing, I'm locked in my room. I'm seeing students one-on-one -on -one or in a small group, and I'm not getting out there, and I'm sure people are going, what is she doing all day? So it's become very important for me to be out there and be visible and be like, what can I help you with? What do you need? You know, are there any students that are cropping up that we need to have a discussion about? Do you have questions for me, for what I'm doing with students? Um, just to take that mystery out of what it is I actually do in um, that back room office, you know, out of the way. And then lastly, and absolutely most importantly, is um, relationships with your families and your students. We've talked a lot today about kids not feeling safe and, you know, kind of how trauma breaks into that ability for kids to be able to focus at school and think that things will be okay when they're constantly thinking things aren't going to be okay. Mm -hmm. To come in and have someone who's there no matter what, that unconditional positive regard, I don't remember, <laughs> you know, that counseling part of that is huge, I think, for these kids. I had a student that was apparently in the office with their parents the other day and you know, they said, blah, 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 Miss Evans. And they said, who's Miss Evans? She goes, she's my counselor, and she really cares about what I'm saying, you know. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> that's really nice. So I think hearing those things, you know, having kids come in and see me just because they're not feeling safe in that moment. And, you know, I say, okay, what do you need? You know, and we get them back to class as soon as we can, but they've got a sense of there's someone there on my team. And so I want all community members and all school district people to have, be that person for our students. Robin, what's your minute or two of advice? Um, I think uh, some of it like reiterates what a lot of other people have said, but, um, but I think really inviting all the stakeholders to the table and recognizing that all of these people are part of the team, and that includes the student and the families and the administrators and the teachers, and if possible, higher district people. But um, these are all people, all important players that are part of any individual student's team. And we need everybody to be on the same page. We've talked about consistency a lot. Um, and it's really important that we're all on the same page. And it's really important to the students to see us all on the same page. So um, I would say that my biggest advice is making sure that you're inviting all of the important voices to the table. And that definitely includes the student and the family. 
All right, Jen, what's your last tidbit of advice? Um, I think knowing up front that it's a long process and that it takes, to me it seems like, oh, this makes sense, let's do this. But then when I brought it back, to, when it was brought to our schools, it was more of a shift than I was anticipating. So I think knowing that it's gonna take a long time will help set realistic expectations for people. And I think what Robin was saying earlier about like having admin on board, but also having staff on board and having it come from top down and bottom up really resonated with me as something important. I think also just the teach, like making sure the teachers are taking care of themselves and that their vicarious trauma and burnout is being addressed too is really important component because we can teach the teachers strategies and skills and school staff skills, but again, like many people have stated, if, if they're not taking care of themselves, then they can't be the best people that they wanna be for the students or they leave the school entirely and then you're starting over every year with a new crop of teachers. So I just think that making sure that that stays in the forefront, taking care of teachers and making sure that they know what's going on and how to support themselves, then they'll be in a place where they can really be there for the students and the way that they wanna be and the way that we all want them to be. Before we open it for questions, can you please join me in thanking our panelists? <laughs>
Sure. So, um, so one of the things I do is when, when I go in and I do a trauma-informed education training for staff, um, one area that we talk about is the empathy barrier and what gets in the way of, of an adult maybe having empathy for a child. And some of that goes into recognizing what we call, in quotes, we call it our stuff. Um, so the, the assumptions or the thoughts or the feelings that come up for us when we are interacting with a child that's demonstrating some in incredibly high-risk behavior. And we normalize for teachers that, you know, it's, it's natural for your own fight-or-flight response to be activated when you are threatened by a, having a desk kind of thrown in your direction. Um, that's a natural response. Um, and so really giving teachers the space to acknowledge without judgment that um, whatever they're feeling, whatever assumptions they're having, Having, we would rather that be coming out into the open in a safe space for us to talk through it so that it's not going to come out in insidious ways in terms of the way they're interacting with the kids. So that's, so that's one thing that we do and, um, and we are developing a whole PD that's strictly focused on, on developing self-care tools and on giving teachers um, a, a space to really, uh, a safe space to really acknowledge that stuff. Um, we've also had, um, because we can't get on the PD calendar all the time, um, we've ha our, our clinicians have been really stealthy in the way that they, that they offer um, support to staff. So we do what we call dine and delves during lunch. So we'll offer lunch to teachers and have them come in and we'll do a training on self-care. And so one of our, um, Actually, it's our it's our clinical team at Cox right now. They did the Stein and Delve with teachers, and um, and they they gave teachers a bunch of different tools that they could use that could um, help them with self care in the moment. Things they could put around their desk, things that aren't necessarily. Um, noticeable to the students as like, oh, this is something I need for self-care, but for the teacher, just seeing it can help them be a reminder of like, oh yeah, that's the little signal that's supposed to tell me to take a deep breath. Or, oh yeah, that's, that's, my, that's my mandala that I colored that's, that's helping me, remind me to relax. And so really giving teachers a space to acknowledge what's coming up for them because it is difficult work. They do have a lot on their plate. They have a lot of competing priorities and they have some real feelings that come up around this and some real assumptions that need to be addressed without, without judgment. And so really giving teachers a safe space to do that, um, as well as the self-care piece and teaching them about vicarious trauma and the fact that um, I think it was in Christopher Blodgett's um, slideshow how, they, how he demonstrated that a lot of times it's the school staff that know um, the trauma that's coming up for kids. Kids will go and talk to their teachers or talk to the yard, yard duty staff or talk to the cafeteria staff. Um, and, and so they often know and are holders of this information and don't really know what to do with it after that. Um, and so really acknowledging that teachers are on the front line for this um, and giving them tools to help process this and let it go so that they don't have to be the sole holders of this piece of information. Any other questions? I see a hand over here. Good? Yeah, we're good. Hi. Um, the uh, the first question that I have is around the framing of the word and the dynamics of trauma for young people to understand their lived experience. And I'm wondering how we can also understand all the capital that can come from having lived experience, i.e. attunement, i.e. sensitivity, i.e. Um, heightened empathy for others. And so I'm wondering in your experience how you've served as meaning-making partners to young people as they navigate their own lived experience. And then I have a second question. I mean, I think that we, well, so we're, I'm working with elementary school, so that's a different uh, age level. Um, so I don't know if you have a different for high school, but we're not really talking to the kids about um, them as being traumatized. It's more about this is teaching them how to recognize their feelings, how to self-regulate, how to problem solve, how to build empathy, and um, teaching teachers on how to structure their classrooms. So I guess from my perspective, we're not really labeling the kids to the kids. It's more just knowing based on what their life experience is, where their skills might be lagging and how we can um, enhance those qualities, build on their strengths and then also strengthen their weaknesses. I was trying to think how I'd answer your question. I think a lot of it is kind of those counseling skills a lot, probably most of us in here have anyway. 
in that you reflect upon strengths. So if they're telling you something that is hard and that they're struggling with, you're reflecting that they're resilient, that they're able to push through on something that's hard. So you're kind of giving back to them based on what they're giving you, the strengths. You're teasing that out for them so that they can have some experience of success because some, at the point they get to you, have had minimal experience of success. And I also um, have most of my experience in the elementary school, so, um, but there's a lot of great um, literature and material that speaks to trauma in a very age-appropriate way. Um, one book um, that's coming to mind is a terrible, I think it's called A Terrible Thing Happened. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of the Bounce Back curriculum, which is the CBITS uh, which is Cognitive Behavioral Intervention for Trauma in Schools, um, the CBITS curriculum for elementary school kids. And so there is a way to acknowledge that scary things do happen to kids and that there are certain things that, um, symptoms, although we wouldn't call it that, but there are some certain things that they may be experiencing that could be because they experienced this very, very scary thing that happened um, or this very, very sad thing that, sad and unexpected thing that happened. Um, and so I think there are ways to, to talk about trauma in a way that's very age appropriate that still gives the, in terms of the cognitive behavioral piece that um, I know was mentioned in, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on your name, but the doctor's amazing um, speech, but, uh, but um, that, t that teach kids uh, about, about trauma, that provide them with psychoeducation, and then there's, um, which is a huge part of cognitive behavioral therapy. And then the other piece is acknowledging what's happening in their body, so giving them a true body awareness of what feelings they're experiencing and where they're experiencing it in their body, how it manifests, um, what anxiety is. Um, we've done some push-ins in, in our fourth grade and fifth grade classes to teach kids about anxiety um, and how that manifests in the body. So I think there are ways to, to talk about trauma um, in very age-appropriate ways that, that, give te that give kids the education they need to be able to understand themselves and what they're experiencing. Uh, one thing I would add, too, from an educational perspective is there are limits to what educators can provide relative to mental health services. So one of the things that I believe that our practitioners are sensitive to are, are these counseling and other types of supports for the student and the families that help in relation to educational performance and general success. But in some cases, the, ch the child presents and the family presents with needs above and beyond what we can accomplish. So I think it's twofold. We work with families and kids to help them succeed in school and trying to line up consistently community-based resources so they can get more in-depth and more intensive services um, for the family and for the individual child as needed by that particular child. Well, th thank you all so much. Thank you all very, very much. You all are heroes every single day for what you do for all of our students. So once again, let's please give them a round of applause for what they do.